Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Primetime Alive program, Charting the Course of Cardiac Diets. I am Vicki Newell, and I manage the Primetime Alive program here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. As a reminder, I think you all know this, we do wear masks here, but when we are in a space where we can maintain social distancing, um, we are able to do that. And since there's only two of us in here today in a room for 150, um, we certainly can do that, and then that way you can understand us better. Just want to remind you all um, about submitting a question. Um, we will get to those at the end of the program. In the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll probably see an arrow like this that I'm pointing at. When you open, click that, it opens a box similar to what this looks like. It might look a little different, but at the bo bottom it says enter a question for the staff. Just type your question in there, hit send, and then it will uh, be put in our queue and we'll get to those at the end of the program. All right, our presenter today is Jolene Wolf. And as I say that, I see that Jolene does not have her microphone on. So we'll have her come up and work on that while I finish get, introducing her. Um, Jolene received her Bachelor of Science from Mary Crest College and her Master's of Public Health from Des Moines University. She has been a clinical dietitian at Mary Greeley Medical Center since 1990. She lives in Ames with her husband, Ray, and Kat, is it Leah? Leah. Leah. All right. And she is a frequent presenter for our Primetime Alive program, and we're fortunate to have her. She always does a great job of researching topics for us and is a wonderful educator, and so we are thankful that she is willing to do these for us on a regular basis. Um, so please welcome Jolene. I'm just going to check with her, make sure that her micro her microphone's working. You got on. turned on? I don't think it's on. Okay, let me get my mask on. All right, here we go. This is the first virtual presentation I've ever done, so bear with me if I uh, have to call Vicki or Tim down to do a little technology training for me. I think we've got it ready to go. Um, I have been here 30 years, and... Uh, it's always kind of fun to step out of my role as a clinical dietitian where I go to see patients who are in the hospital um, and get to do a presentation for you folks who are actually volunteering to come and see me instead of the other way around. So I appreciate the invitation today. Since I've been a dietitian for over 31 years now, I thought it might be fun to look back at the course of cardiac or heart healthy nutrition over the years because there have been a lot of changes, a lot of trends and fads have come and gone. And so I thought it might be kind of fun to explore those so you know how far we've come and then really end with the evidence uh, base and what we're telling people nowadays, which granted the, the big things haven't changed. Vicki and I were just talking about that, but the little details have changed. So what I've seen come and go through the years that we'll touch on first are the, the fat-free diets, the low cholesterol diets, the sugar-free diets, high in fiber, gluten-free, low salt. Some of these you know are still with us and some we don't hear about quite so often. When I um, first became a dietitian in the, the mid to late 80s, I think was just when doctors were understanding that cholesterol was associated with heart disease. And so since people that had tended to have heart disease also tended to have high cholesterol, the thought was, well, we must have to bring that cholesterol down so we can bring the heart disease down. So the public, when they got a hold of this uh, thought process was, well, gosh, we must have to eat less cholesterol. Eat less cholesterol or cholesterol level will come down. Well, of course, manufacturers got a hold of that because manufacturers always want to make money, of course, and so they will do whatever it is that the public wants. And they said, okay, let's put no cholesterol stickers. And honest to goodness, I saw them on bananas. I saw red labels on peanut butter that said no cholesterol. What's funny about that, of course, is that these are, not, these are plant products and only animal products have cholesterol in. So they were advertising something that was already a no-brainer. So, you know, that didn't really work, that we ate less cholesterol. So, well, there's still cholesterol in our blood, so how are we going to fix that? Well, we must have to add fiber to our diet to bind up all that cholesterol. Maybe that will work. 
Well, we did find that fiber, and particularly soluble fiber, if people ate a lot of that, it tended to lower their cholesterol levels a little bit. Um, and what is full of soluble fiber, but things like oatmeal, apples, pears. Um, so, you know, if we concentrate that oatmeal in, in, into the oat bran, we have a very concentrated source of fol- soluble fiber. And oat bran started getting put in everything. And oat bran donuts were even born. Now, if any of you out there feel like that by adding some oat bran to a donut, you all of a sudden magically have this healthy product that's going to cure your heart disease, I would love to schedule a a dietitian appointment with you, one of our outpatient dietitians, because we have a little to chat about. So, well, that didn't quite work as well as we wanted it to either. So then we moved on to the fat-free craze. If it's not the cholesterol, it must be the total fat. So everything was fat-free, fat-free salad dressings and fat-free breads and remember the Snackwell cookies and cakes. Um, And there were honestly, I have to admit, dietitians that would tell people, you know what, you can eat all the bagels you want to all day long as long as you don't put any cream cheese on it because that fat is bad. So really what happened is refined carbohydrates replaced healthy fats. But guess what? We didn't really get any healthier. We didn't decrease our heart disease a whole lot. Okay, so we replaced the fat with sugar and refined carbohydrates and decided that wasn't such a good idea. So the thinking was, well, carbs must be bad too. So then the Atkins diet was born. Everybody was eating meat and eggs and bacon and butter. Um, People did lose a little bit of weight because it really limited the amount of food that you ate. Uh, But I think this really led to then the artificial sweeteners um, abounding. Um, You had sugar-free this and sugar-free that. When I first became a dietitian, we had saccharin, and then NutraSweet or aspartame came along, and now I think there's at least a dozen um, artificial sweeteners. There's a whole lot more that are out there nowadays. Well, and they realized it wasn't just the the fat and the cholesterol um, causing the vessels to clog up, but they realized that blood pressure... um, had an effect on how our blood vessels work as well. And of course, sodium has an effect on blood pressure. Um, So we decided people really needed to eat a low salt diet as well. And to this day, after all of these years, I'll still walk into a patient's room and talk to them about their low salt diet. And they'll tell me, oh, I'm already on a low salt diet. I never add salt at the table. Well, that's wonderful. And it's a start. I tell them it's the first step. But only about 30% of our diet comes from what we add to food. 70% of the sodium in our diet comes from what is already in food, packaged and processed and restaurant foods. So then the the thing is, what's the right amount? And honestly, there is still quite a bit of controversy about there. What is the perfect amount? But the perfect amount is generally less than what all of us are eating. I can tell you that. Um, Some of the evidence and some of the newer research says um, for CHF, maybe more like 2,300 to 3,500 milligrams might be kind of a sweet spot because there's quality of life measures that are involved as well. But right now, what the guidelines are telling us from the the good evidence that we have right now, uh, most of the cardiologists are still telling people with congestive heart failure to shoot for 1,500 milligrams a day. And I know that's really hard to do because I've made menus for people. Um, If you have coronary artery disease, maybe more like 2,000 milligrams a day is what the guideline is telling people. So just for an example, I wanted to throw in a fairly typical fast food meal. It's just three things, a quarter pounder with cheese, a small order of fries, and a small chocolate shake. Um, Certainly, at least when we were teenagers, we'd eat this, uh, you know, in no time, and a lot of us still would. Just this one meal with three items adds up to almost 1,600 milligrams of sodium. But what I really wanted to point out was people will tell me, oh, if I go out to eat, I always order the French fries without salt. Wonderful. It's, it's a start. And the really good thing is, is, of course, you get hot French fries because they can't take the ones that are already in the salty bin. So there's that, too. But look that the French fries only have 160 milligrams of sodium to begin with. Where you're really getting that whopping amount of sodium is from the sandwich. And a lot of people don't think about that. So it's hidden in a lot of things that we don't think of. Well, we're still not healthy. Um, we'll learn about the 
propensity of heart disease in a little bit. Um, but lately, haven't you all seen the gluten? The gluten-free diet has been with us for quite a while. It's a fad that just doesn't seem to quite go away. And certainly for people who have celiac disease, which is about 1% of the population, this is a very important diet. They can't have gluten. Um, it gets them in trouble pretty fast. There's another condition called gluten uh, sensitivity that those folks often also benefit from a gluten-free diet. But for the other 98 to 99% of us who don't have this problem, gluten-free diet really probably aren't going to cure everything that ails us like the uh, promoters like to tell us. And in fact, it can be somewhat harmful because when you eliminate gluten, you eliminate a lot of the traditional high fiber grains that are so important for our gut. So keep that in mind to not just jump on the bandwagon. So all of these trends through the years, um, had a lot of foods that kind of went along with them. I'll go way back to when I was a child. I call my mom a bit of a granola mom. I grew up on a farm and we had our, a lot of our own fruits and vegetables. We had a big garden. We had our own cows that we milked and we had uh, our own meat that we had butchered. Um, we often had a jar of wheat germ because wheat germ was the trendy thing. And if you added wheat germ to things, you know, it was going to be good for you. I still remember that jar of wheat germ in the cupboard. We talked about the oat bran craze and then the sterols and stanols, which do have some, some substance to the evidence to help. Um, but they started putting those in orange juice and um, all sorts of margarines and other products. Remember the palm wonderful, the pomegranate phase that we all went through? Gosh, if we just drank pomegranate juice every day, we were going to be cured of everything that ailed us. And even just juicing in general, if any of you have been to the state fair and, and talked to the juice guy that was putting everything in the juicer, that was, that was going to cure us. And then there was the quinoa phase. And quinoa is a perfectly wonderful whole grain with lots of good protein in it and good fiber. Nothing wrong with any of these products. They're all healthy. Um, but just by eating just one of them, it's, it's not going to cure us. Remember the kale phase, the kale chips and the kale smoothies, putting green and everything. And again, kale, a wonderful food, but in and of itself, it's not going to help us. Kombucha and the other fermented foods, I would say, are the biggest food trend and craze right now. The, uh, the sourdough breads and the uh, kimchi and the sauerkraut and things like that. So again, um, healthy foods, but they need to work with other things. So people get frustrated because advice seems to change every day. You read a headline one day that says one thing for nutrition advice, and then two days later, there's a headline that says the exact opposite. And I understand how frustrating it is for people. I do want you to understand that the basics of healthy and heart-healthy nutrition over decades have not changed. We're still telling people, eat your fruits and vegetables, get your whole grains, use lean protein. Those haven't changed. It's just the little details. And I often tell people when I do a presentation, the dietitians eat crow every two years because the, the little details keep changing, and that's because we do research and find out more things and more evidence, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But just to help you out a little bit to know what to believe and to ferret out what's important out of these uh, articles that you might be seeing, the number one thing is don't just look at the headlines. I think especially in today's era where the print media is really fighting to survive and we've got all these bloggers and online media, you can't just look at the headlines because in order to get you to read their article, they make it fantastical. And what the headline says is not necessarily what the meat of the article says. So the next thing to look at is how was the study done? Was it an association, meaning these people ate this and they had less of this, so that must have been one cause the other? Or was it a randomized control trial? And a randomized control trial um, is the gold standard of uh, studies. A randomized control trial is where they have two arms of the study. The experimental product is given to one and not the other, but neither group knows which one is getting the experiment, and no, neither does the researcher. So the results at the end are not biased in any way. Was the study done with people or was it done with rats? There's nothing wrong with starting. A lot of our studies start with rats. 
generally, you know, most of us are a little okay if an experiment goes wrong and a few rats die. But if an experiment goes wrong and a few people die, we get kind of excited about that. So we tend to start with rats. But do understand that rats are not people. They have a shorter lifespan. Their systems are not identical to ours. So just because something happens in a rat doesn't necessarily mean that it will um, flow over into what happens in people. Also look at the study size. Um, was it done with 10 people? Was it done with 100 people? Was it done with 100,000 people? The bigger the study, the more likely that there wasn't bias involved or, or uh, just a fluke happened um, that kind of skewed the results. And then the study time. Um, if you fed me uh, an extra piece of cheesecake every day for two weeks, I'm probably not gonna develop heart disease. But if you fed me an extra piece of cheesecake every day for 10 years, Mm, you might start seeing some effects. So that study time is important as well. And then lastly, is what you're reading a reputable research journal that's been peer reviewed? Um, or is it a popular magazine like you know, Time Magazine? And there's nothing wrong with Time Magazine, um, but they just have different standards to uphold. So keep those things in mind when you're reading those headlines. Um, this is an example of correlation, not necessarily being causation. The green line is uh, the per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese in the United States between 2000 and 2009. Notice that it correlates almost identically with the number of civil engineering doctorates awarded in the United States over that same time period. Do you really think that civil engineering doctorates caused more mozzarella cheese to be eaten? Or do you think the eating of the mozzarella cheese caused people to get more civil engineering doctorates? It's just a fluke. It's a random thing that they happen to, to correlate. So just remember that correlation is not always causation. So who do we trust? I talked about those uh, experts in the fields. You know, what, what recommendations, guidelines, organizations do we trust? So the American Heart Association and the American Car College of Cardiology, when I used to teach the cardiac rehab classes, I kept very uh, tight uh, look at on these groups and what the recent evidence was, because they do a very nice job of pulling out the really well-done studies to make their evidence-based recommendations. Of course, the National Institute of Health, they keep a, a nice library of well-researched articles. The National Lipid Association has some great references that I'll share with you in a bit. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the professional organization that dietitians belong to. And then what's really exciting, the dietary guidelines, uh, they are published every five years. And so they just came out in December of 2020. And when Vicki asked me to do this presentation last fall, I said, oh, that's perfect timing because we'll have the new dietary guidelines by then. A lot of people wonder, you know, why does the government spend so much money researching dietary guidelines, making dietary guidelines? It takes them five years, every five years to do this. Well, it's, and then a lot of the public, of course, doesn't read it, and they certainly, a lot of them don't follow it, but it does provide guidelines for any nutrition-related public health program. So think school food service, think um, child care centers that get funding for their food program, think congregate meals, all of those uh, get guidance on what they should be feeding people from this. So it is really important. I did um, provide the link here for you. I will warn you that this document is, I think, 165 pages long. Um, but it has different chapters, and it, it really, uh, you know, you can pull out the things that are important to you. But it, it really is quite well done. What I'll tell you uh, is new from the previous five years is that in all the former uh, nutrition dietary guidelines, it started at age two and went on up to adulthood. This is the first year that they have included the zero to two-year-olds. They thought, you know what, nutrition is important from day one and we need to get recommendations for the little ones as well and get them started. So that's new. What's not new is that these set of dietary guidelines focus on dietary patterns, not single foods or single nutrients. And this is the third rendition that focused on a pattern instead of single foods and nutrients. Instead of saying, oh, eat more vitamin D or eat more potatoes, it says this is the pattern of, of things that you need to eat. Some controversies. Last fall in about November, they put out... Uh, 
a preliminary report uh, and then got feedback on it from experts. And we really thought that they were going to tell people to uh, decrease the added sugar from a 10% of their calories down to 6%. There was some good evidence saying that we're still eating way too much sugar. In the end, they did not make the change and they left it at 10%. And the other change that we thought would happen from that preliminary report um, was that there was some pretty good evidence uh, that they should change their recommendation from two drinks a day for men to, to just one, just like what they tell women. Um, but there just wasn't quite enough to have them make that change. So they left it the same as well. So what they found in the dietary guidelines was that the patterns that were associated with positive health out in outcomes were a lower intake of red and processed meats, sugar-sweetened foods and drinks, and refined grains. That's not new, is it? We're all, we've all been hearing about this. And a higher intake of vegetables and fruits, legumes, whole grains, lower nonfat dairy, lean meats and poultry, seafood, nuts, unsaturated vegetable oils. What I like about this slide is notice that the higher intake is a bigger list than the lower intake. So we should take some positives away from that. And keep these foods in mind because you're going to keep seeing it over and over as we go on this afternoon. So uh, the dietary guidelines in chapter six uh, is specific for, for us, for we older adults, for age 60 and over. It's never too late to make improvements. Um, I think of my grandmother who lived to be 101 and a half and lived independently in her own home until well after her 100th birthday. I'm really only 58 years old, so I'm only about halfway there. So, you know, we got a long way to go. And, and even if you're 70 or 80, uh, making improvements can help the quality of your life. There is a heightened risk of malnutrition that occurs with age and I think one of the reasons is that we need the same nutrients that we did when we were younger, but we don't need as many calories. So the, we need to eat less food with the same nutrients, and so all of that food that we eat really needs to be high-quality food. Um, one of the reasons we need less calories is because we have less physical activity often. Um, I actually have a little more time to exercise now than I did when my kids were so busy in activities, uh, but it is a little different kind of exercise than I used to do. Our metabolism changes for about every uh, decade after the age of 30. Uh, you do decrease your metabolism a bit. We have some muscle and bone loss. And unfortunately, uh, if you've learned like I have, that as you get older, <laughs> about after the age of 40, uh, things just don't work as well. Um, we're more prone to some disease conditions that we need to learn to manage. Often that's managed with multi multiple medications, and some of those do affect absorption of nutrients. What they came up with for females over the age of 60 is a general guideline of 1,600 to 2,200 calories a day. For males, 2,000 to 2,600. Um, so U.S. healthy dietary patterns for older adults. This is the, the yeah, chapter, and Tim put that up for me so I wouldn't have to scroll down and show it to you, but it is chapter six in the dietary guidelines. And then I wanted to show you, um, this is in that chapter, and here's those calorie levels that we talked about. So you can pick which one you think that you belong in. And it's very specific on the vegetables, the fruits, the grains, the dairy, the protein, on how many of each that you should need and broken out into the colors of fruits and vegetables. So it's a really nice pattern if you want to take a peek at it. And then the next page goes on with the current intakes of folks 60 and older. These blue lines are the recommended intake range. The purple are what we are actually eating here in the United States. So you can see that we do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. You should have listened to what your mother told you years ago. Eat your vegetables. Uh, we barely get enough grains, whole grains. We certainly aren't drinking the dairy that is recommended. And protein, men do a pretty good job, women not so much. So we have a little work to do on the things that we need to be eating more of. The things that we need, whoops, excuse me, the things we need to be eating less of, um, the added sugars, notice that over 50% of us eat more than the recommended 10% of our calories from added sugar. 80% of us, eat more than 10% of our diet from saturated fat. And gosh, almost 100% of men eat more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium. And 
a lot of women as well. So we've got some work to do. We need to kind of flip these around. Some special considerations that they mentioned for older folks were protein, especially the older, uh, uh, the older you get, um, people do tend to eat less protein. And I think one of the reasons that I see here in the hospital is chewing and swallowing issues. Um, know that there's plenty of other kinds of protein besides just meat that you can, can get in. We need to try to decrease that muscle loss that happens with age. So we do need a little more protein. B12 is a vitamin that's not absorbed very well in the older stomach, and some of the medications that older folks often take decrease the absorption as well. But a B12 is abundant in breakfast cereal, so it, that's an, an easy way to get some in. Beverages can be a problem for people. Um, I'm one that I'm of that age where sometimes I have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, and I'd really rather not do that. And so I think one of the reasons that older people drink less fluid than they should is uh, maybe they're on a diuretic. They don't want to have to rush to the bathroom all the time, but that's, that's really a mistake. It's important to be hydrated. And then a caveat on the alcoholic beverages for older folks, they did not make any different recommendation for people over 60 than the, than the general population. No more than two drinks a day for men, one for women. But they do mention that the effects of alcohol are seen earlier in people that are older. And so many of us have a, a few balance issues. We're, we're not quite as steady as we used to be. And then if we put some alcohol on top of that and aren't aware that it might affect us, it could be very problematic and cause some falls. So do keep that in mind. All right, so that was the first guideline or organization that has some reputable information for us. Another one that is the National Lipid Association, and I found some really great um, handouts. Let's see if this will open for me. This one is um, heart healthy eating using the plate method. We use the plate method a lot here at Mary Greeley. I use it to teach um, carbohydrates for folks with diabetes, but it works equally as well for a heart healthy diet. The first thing is to choose a nine inch plate. I can tell you, I went to a Mexican restaurant one time in Minneapolis and my meal came on a turkey platter, I kid you not. Um, so a nine inch plate, which is smaller than a lot of us have, and then your portion sizes will automatically be more in control. So it's telling us to fill a quarter of our plate with some kind of a lean protein, a quarter of our plate with a whole grain or a starchy vegetable like a sweet potato. And then what's really different for most people is to have half of your plate be filled with non-starchy vegetables. Could be a beautiful tossed salad, carrots, broccoli, beets, uh, Lots of lots of good options out there. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think I gave a presentation to this group on on eating vegetables, and we talked about roasting vegetables, and that's a very popular way to get some good healthy veggies in there. And then on the side, a dairy or a dairy alternative if you're not a milk drinker, fruit on the side as well, using heart healthy oils, things like um, a, a liquid oil, a handful of nuts, avocado. Those are the healthy kind of fats. Flavoring your foods instead of with salt, with herbs and seasonings. And then mainly drinking water or some non-calorie beverage. So I've got another one here that I want to show you from the National Lipid Association. This has, in their cardioprotective dietary patterns, and you can look up the links I think that Vicki has given you, a wealth of information on different heart-healthy eating styles, Asian style, Latino style, vegetarian style, heart-healthy eating on a budget. Um, but particularly, um, they have Mediterranean and DASH style. I'll click on this Mediterranean style. It tells you a little bit about what Mediterranean style is and how to do it and kind of a sample meal pattern. And it does the same with the DASH diet and all of the others. So these are great handouts to get you started on some of these um, healthy patterns. Okay, and so then the next organization that we talked about as being reputable is the National Institute of Health. They keep a library of, of uh, good research articles. This one happens to be from the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. And it talks about cardiovascular disease being the leading cause of death in Western countries. And I looked it up, 
COVID has not surpassed heart disease. COVID is actually third. I looked it up. Um, but there is a rising incidence over the past 25 years, so it definitely makes heart disease a public health priority. Um, and so this article aimed to identify potential targets to prevent cardiovascular disease and then what were the magnitude of those benefits. What they found was that a Western diet, traditional American diet versus the Mediterranean diet um, showed excessive production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, don't get all hook, hooked up and hung up on these big words. What that means is causes inflammation and just know that inflammation is bad. We don't want inflammation in our body. Western diets, um, dietary intervention for these allows a better combination of multiple foods and nutrients and healthy diet patterns show a greater magnitude of benefit than any single nutrient supplement. I went through years when, you know, vitamin E was going to be the cure-all, then vitamin D was going to be the cure-all, vitamin C was going to be the cure-all. We need a whole healthy diet pattern because when we eat whole foods, there are synergistic effects. There are things in these uh, foodstuffs that make them better absorbed and more helpful than just trying to pull out the vitamin or mineral. The similarities that they found in all of the healthy dietary patterns, the ones that seemed to be helpful were, and, and look, this is the same kind of things we saw in the dietary guidelines, more fiber, antioxidants, vitamins and minerals and polyphenols, mono and polyunsaturated fats, low glycemic load carbohydrates. These are the ones that are, take longer to digest and they aren't just those simple refined sugars and starches. Low intake of salt, refined sugar, saturated and trans fats. So the translation is we need to increase our intake of fruits, vegetables, legumes, fish and seafood, nuts, seeds, whole grains, vegetable oils, especially extra virgin olive oil and dairy, and decrease our intake of pastries, soft drinks, and processed meat. I told you this would get repetitive. We're finding the same thing across organizations. The Mediterranean diet, um, they found that by just increasing your adherence to the Mediterranean diet by 10% was associated with a 15% decrease in your chance for cardiovascular disease. So you get a lot of bang for your buck, buck even if you just add, you know, get a little bit closer. We don't have to be perfect, but getting closer helps us. Mediterranean diet, people that followed it were less fat. They had lower CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. Remember, we don't want inflammation. Uh, it caused less insulin resistance. We want that insulin to, to make things work for us. Less high blood pressure. So um, from the National Lipid Association, you saw a handout um, on the Mediterranean diet. But here is another really nice one from Sutter Health that actually has a three-day sample menu plan, and it says for your busy schedule. <laughs> and so it, and it also will spell out how much you need of everything and how to stock your kitchen so you can go to the grocery store with kind of a shopping list if you want to follow the Mediterranean diet. So a really, really nice handout. The DASH diet is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. What the DASH diet stands for is actually dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So it's a little bit more honed in on the lower sodium products because it's, it's meant to lower blood pressure. But it not only lowers blood pressure, it, people that follow it also tend to have lower body weight. They have better blood sugars, better blood lipids, um, better um, endothelial or blood vessel function. Their gut microbiomes are better. That could be a whole nother presentation if, if Vicki hasn't done one on gut microbiome. Um, some estimates say that 90% of our immune function is actually in our gut, so that's really important. Less cardiovascular disease risk and even less death risk, so that one's really important. And um, I won't click on this one because I'll make Tim have to go back, but this is also another handout just like the Mediterranean diet one is from the Mayo Clinic, has a three-day sample meal plan on it for you. So the foods that they talk about of all these studies that they looked at that were important were, again, fruits and vegetables. We need to, to really increase our intake of fruits and vegetables. Olive oil has some anti-inflammatory properties. We've known about that for a long time. Nuts, particularly, actually peanuts, which are not truly a nut, but peanuts and walnuts are the, are the best studied for decreasing cardiovascular disease. And there's always a discussion about wine and beer. 
this study felt like there was enough evidence to say that uh, for people who already do consume alcohol, that consuming wine and beer do have some protective effects on the blood vessels. I never, ever, ever stand up here and tell people, if you're not a drinker, gee, start drinking alcohol, it might be good for your heart. The, the protective benefits are not good enough for that. We definitely don't say that. And again, really important to that moderation, which is no more than two drinks a day for men and one for women. We need more fiber, it decreases cholesterol and blood pressure. We need to get a wide variety of micronutrients. These are the little tiny things in food um, that tend to reduce endothelial, those, that blood vessel damage, increase nitric oxide, which is good for our vessels, and inhibit LDL, which is the bad cholesterol that we don't want to be high. Uh, if you get a lot of variety in your diet, you're going to get a lot of these bioactive compounds, those omega-3 fatty acids that are in the fatty fishes, the lycopene that is in the red fruits and vegetables, the phytosterols that are in most plant products, and you can get in fortified margarine still to this day. Polyphenols are present in almost everything that's of plant origin. Um, relevant food sources, here you are again, fruits and vegetables, red wine, tea, coffee, extra virgin olive oil, chocolate, that should make everybody happy because Valentine's Day is coming. Just make sure it's the good dark chocolate. Nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. On to the next organization. I talked about the American Heart Association. The American College of Cardiology is having some very good evidence. What they tell us is that poor diet quality has surpassed every other mortality risk factor. So stress, genetics, um, smoking, they, they say poor diet quality is the worst for us. Recently, cardiovascular deaths have increased in folks in the middle age, between 45 and 64. And I just think about all the people I know that kind of delay marriage and, and, and careers to their late 30s. These are people that have little kids at home. They're just getting started, so we can't have this happen. So we need, and the American Heart Association says, we need to shift from managing heart disease to preventing it in the first place. And healthy dietary patterns to reduce arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk is absolutely critical. So they created 10 strategies. And, and what's wonderful about these is they almost all have something nutrition related. So we dietitians like this. The second one says refer patients to a registered dietitian nutritionist when appropriate. So they want to be screening people for nutrition during their medical visits and referring on. I put in red, follow the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, nutrition and diet recommendations, and I'll show you those in a couple of slides. Include the National Lipid Association nutrition goals, and you got the handouts on the slides from those. Use evidence-based heart-healthy eating patterns. I'll show you that slide at the end of what they've decided the three most heart-healthy eating patterns are. Implement nutrition and lifestyle recommendations. Understand the different types of fat. So saturated fat and trans fat are the ones that are less heart healthy. Polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fat, the ones that are softer or more liquid at room temperature, are the ones that are healthier. Limit excessive intake of cholesterol. We don't talk about cholesterol too much anymore as dietitians because most products that are high in cholesterol are also high in saturated fat. So if we can just have people decreasing their saturated fat, the cholesterol tends to come down along with it, and then you're not having to worry about two different things. But in particular, people with these conditions, heart failure, diabetes, um, they really should limit their cholesterol as well. Include um, dietary add-ons like fiber, the sterols and stanols, probiotics, and then implement physical activity recommendations. Um, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, they've gone hand in hand for years and they will continue to do so. So this is the diet recommendations that I told you we'd come to. And again, I think you're going to see that it's pretty similar to all of the other groups that we've talked about today. Emphasize intake of fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and fish. Replace your saturated fat with the monounsaturates and the polyunsaturates. Decrease sodium and cholesterol, minimize the red and especially processed meats, refined carbs, and sweet beverages. This is sparkling water that I'm drinking here. Uh, avoid trans fats, and this is from the American Heart Association Journal. So it all comes down to 
really they found that these three diets were the ones that were following everyone's recommendations and had the best evidence. The DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, or some kind of a plant-based diet. That doesn't mean necessarily mean that it needs to be 100% vegetarian or vegan as long as it revolves around mostly plant-based foods. So this is what you want to shoot for, for heart health. Um, my last slide um, includes a picture of, of my family. And I wanted to let you know my passion for cardiac nutrition is because my husband, who's second from the left here, um, suffered a cardiac arrest about a year before this picture was taken. And fortunately, um, he was in the right place at the right time. And Mary Greeley and Dr. Bott took very good care of him. And he's doing great. But um, sometimes you don't always know what those risk factors are. Um, he exercised regularly because he's a dietitian's husband, ate a better than average um, diet. Um, he didn't, doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. He had one risk factor, and that was high cholesterol. And he had chosen not to take a medicine for it because he was doing all these other wonderful things. Um, so he felt that you know he was managing his risk. Um, and obviously, that didn't work. So do take all of your risk factors into account and uh, stay in tune with your physician because we had a happy outcome, but it, it could have been different. So I have a real passion. So now time for questions. Yeah. When I went up, Tim said we did not have any questions okay. yet, but we'll wait here a minute and we'll see. and I'll have you read them if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the question says, do they still say that high levels of HDL are protective? And if yes, how can one raise their HDL? Yes, um, I am still hearing this. The, I think the, what they really zone in on is a high LDL as being the, if they're going to look at one portion of cholesterol, they really zone in on trying to decrease the LDL levels. But yes, high HDL levels are still considered um, protective. And mainly with exercise raises HDLs, I do find that my smokers have very low levels of HDL, so quitting smoking would be also an answer if you happen to be a smoker. Ah, polyphenols. Those are kind of uh, micronutrients that are in uh, most plant foods. And not being a chemist, I'm not going to tease them out for you. Just know that if you have a lot of fruits and vegetables, you're going to get lots of polyphenols, and those are good things. Well, I'll close up, but okay. we'll see if any more come through. So any last things you want to? No? Nope. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Jolene. Uh, like I said, she always does a great job. I'm seeing some more so comments coming through about the great presentation, and thank you for the great information. And just know this means you have to come back again another <laughs> time for us. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to remind everyone of our next program. You know, February is Heart Month. So our um, next program is Thursday, February 25th at 2 o'clock. It's Your Heart as You Age, and this that will be Dr. Stuart Christensen who is with um, Mary Greeley Cardiology Clinic giving that program. So we hope you can join us. If you haven't signed up yet, you can go to mgmc.org slash PTA to sign up for that. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, but one last time, thank you, Jolene. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great day.